I'm going to try in 20 minutes to talk about um, a very exciting experience I had um, working across art design and sustainability um, and why I believe it's one of the most important things to kind of have um, anywhere in the world because of so many different things that can, can come from that. And so my main question, which I'm hoping to answer and present um, one way of answering it through my experience is, through an art, design, and science collaboration, is it possible to divert wood byproduct and recycled fiber from going to the landfill? Now, this might seem like kind of an interesting question to present, but I think from the slides and from the information, um, you, will, you will start to see the connections. So currently, I am the assistant professor at Arizona State University in the Wood and Sustainability Program. Um, my background is, is actually I got a uh, Bachelor's of Science at the University of Wisconsin in Madison where I studied uh, chemistry and art. And then I went to San Diego State University to get my master's where I studied, uh, studied under Wendy Mariyama. And so um, for me, uh, most of my uh, career has been somewhere between balancing kind of the science art drives that I have and um, where can the pieces that I make exist within that cloud. So here are some examples of earlier work just to give you a sense of where I was coming from. Mostly traditional furniture design um, and then exploring other materials integrated <coughs> along with the functional work. Um, I do manipulate the material to a certain degree and for example this is woven wood veneer. And then sometimes I don't feel like I need to manipulate the material at all. Sometimes it's just a matter of how you can puzzle piece or place these, these um, wood objects in space um, based off whatever the inherent properties um, or the value that you see in the material are. And so these are shims. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with wood, wood shims. Um, these are stacked wood shims. And so basically they're not glued so that you can use um, them as individual kind of modular tapered unit forms. And if I were to glue these shims, then what happens is I change the value after the installation. No one can really use them as shims anymore. So for me, there is a sense of responsibility that I have as an artist working with a large quantities of material because I don't want to generate a lot more waste. Um, so if there's a way that at the end of the installation or an exhibition, that material can somehow be used again, then I'm going to seek that out. Um, I'm also not using wood um, solely as a material. I, I will also work with other materials, fiber-based um, plastics. There's an example of condemned fire hose, but then I created an outdoor pathway. Um, but for me to explain the residency and the scientific endeavor that um, I worked on, I think a little bit more additional history would make sense than why I'm so driven to think about materials in a different way and why I think it's uh, very important to think about waste. So I did a residency at the San Francisco Recycling and Disposal um, Center, and I found that there were lots of um, two by fours and construction waste that was coming through. And I decided to make these functional benches out of not only the lumber, but also um, excess concrete that was coming from the local uh, city improvements of San Francisco. So these are images of the two by fours that I reclaimed and then um, and then created uh, bench bases out of on the upper image. And then on the lower right image, that's actually concrete, excess concrete being diverted from foundation pours in San Francisco that are then being poured into the molds that I made. And the resulting forms are these eight foot long modular benches um, made completely out of um, materials that would have gone to the lab. <coughs> So that experience really opened my eyes uh, to the problems of waste. So San Francisco is one of the most progressive cities in the states in terms of addressing some of these issues. And seeing all that waste come into one location and then knowing that if we don't use it, it's going to go off to the landfill um, really kind of forced me to think a little bit more closely about, well, if I'm going to make work, what can I do to address as an artist and a designer within my own practice, what can I do about the waste that I'm generating? So at another residency um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, which is actually where I went to school before undergrad, I was invited to come back as a resident artist. 
And while I was there, um, I was able to work with John F. Hunt from the USDA Forest Products Laboratory at the same time that I was doing my residency at the UW. So here's a, a couple of images of the lab at Forest Products um, Laboratory uh, new Centennial Research Building. And um, this is just some information about John. Um, I can tell you he's an amazing collaborator, um, not just his personality, but the kind of innovative stuff he's working in. And um, for over 30 years, he's been at Forest Products Laboratory working with composite um, research. And here are just some of the few examples of what he's worked on. So not only um, fiber-based and fiber-molded materials, but also um, 3D um, model geometries. And um, John has also been working with a variety of raw materials. So it could be old corrugated cardboard, um, post-consumer um, newspaper, and actually even cow manure. So there's a variety of um, materials that John has used to make composite boards. So while I was kind of splitting my residency partly between being at UW-Madison and then going to Forest Products Laboratory, um, I was trying to think, well, what am I going to make while I'm here? And this is the wood shop that I was working in. And so I decided to work with an existing, um, a couple bundles of scrap wood that were generated from a local mill place. And I started creating modified Lincoln logs. So I was just generating as many possible pieces as I could and working on different configurations. While at the same time, um, selectively isolating and milling the species. So if I was milling up maple, I would bag that and set this aside. When I was working with poplar, I would also collect that. And so in generating all this material, um, I approached John, well, can we start working with um, other types of raw material in the composite forming? Can we alter some of the variables and see what happens? So um, John agreed, and um, we started to make some boards. And this is just an example of kind of some of the forming processes that we were using. And these are actually the very first two boards that we made. Now, the significance of this um, will be clear in just a second. But I do want to show you that from the boards that we made, partially from the sawdust that I was generating and uh, additional recycled fiber, I was able to make more of the Lincoln Log modified shapes. And then at the Madison Children's Museum, this uh, installation is still suspended there. This is from 2010. And it's about 16 feet by 16 feet. And it is a combination of the pieces of wood that you saw earlier that I had created into modified Lincoln Logs, along with the um, composite material that I then cut up into the Lincoln Logs. So if you can see the differences in the solid wood and then the pieces underneath it, that's made from the sawdust. So this installation is almost a complete use of all materials, with nothing almost going to the waste. And for me, as an artist, that felt really good because I'm addressing even the byproduct that I'm generating from milling. And knowing that in the future, maybe another five years down the road, the Children's Museum may find that they want to replace this exhibit. So I pre-finished the wood, and then the museum is instructed to cut them up into little pieces and then donate them to um, classes around the Madison area so that the kids can use the pieces to play with after the life of this installation. For me, um, it's very important that I'm not going to be contributing to the problem of waste. And if I can think within my own art um, pieces how to address that, then I think that's a really good way of suggesting that it is possible to do that. Um, so instead of kind of with a heavy hand telling people you should be really conscious, I'm trying to just present those examples so that people can see visually and experience it physically um, and then make their own decision if this is something they want to approach within their, or integrate into their own practice. So um, while that installation was being installed uh, in the ceiling of the Madison Children's Museum, John asked me if I wanted to continue doing research and development of this material. And this was back in 2010. And we are still actually doing research and development on this material. So um, we actually filed a provisional patent. Um, I then started an LLC, Interwoven Labs, so that I'd be eligible to apply for an SBIR grant. Um, we didn't get the grant. However, at the time that I was doing this stuff, I was not 
um, employed as a professor. I'm still working as an artist and a, um, and a part-time educator. Um, because I just recently um, have been employed at Arizona State University, um, there's a lot of additional support that I'm going to be receiving from that university. Um, so I will get to that in a little bit, but I want to show you that um, when I was still working as an artist, um, without much support, um, I was trying to create um, this kind of uh, innovative kind of artist outreach and educational aspect, like all tied into one, so that if I was continuing to do residencies elsewhere, that I could still have the students that I was working with um, have access to this material. So that I wasn't going to say, oh, after this particular experience, that was it. That I would somehow figure a way to carry this material with me until I could eventually get that level of support um, that I needed. So I still do research at the lab, but some of you might be wondering, well, what's the big deal about the boards that you made? Um, I'm sure that a lot of you here are familiar with um, composite boards such as particle board, MDF, and um, OSB. Those are kind of the more common ones that are made in a similar way, but not the same way as the boards that we made. The main difference between the boards that we've made and these boards is that we have no added formaldehyde. So that is a huge difference for those of you who are um, sensitive to the um, VOC emissions coming from boards that are made with formaldehyde. And some of you might even not realize that some of your cabinetry um, and things within your office space are actually probably built with a core of a particle board or MDF. So urea formaldehyde is actually um, really used in um, interior application um, based composite materials, so particle board and MDF. Uh, phenol formaldehyde is really um, used in OSB, so exterior applications where it's going to be subject to the elements, um, water, moisture issues. Regardless, whether it's urea or phenol, those are being off-gassed from those materials. And um, the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, um, being omitted in small areas especially, um, people who are inhabiting those spaces notice a change in terms of, it can be from respiratory issues to rashes, sensitivities. And um, I don't know if you remember when Hurricane Katrina um, it happened in, in Louisiana. Um, actually, FEMA went in, and there were many trailers there that were um, lined in the interiors with um, part uh, with composite boards that had been off-gassing. And so, a lot of people who were inhabiting those trailers were complaining about, you know, uh, the conditions um, within that space. Um, what else can I be doing while I'm, you know, while I'm working as an artist or an educator is everything from testing the material, working with people at the facilities. So for example, here are some samples that were being prepared, um, static bending tests, and additional tests um, following the ASTM guidelines. And what we found from our initial, oh, this isn't clear. What we found from our initial results is if you can see all the blue diamonds, um, are actually um, the composite material samples that we generated. The lines, um, the red line for MDF and the, the black line for particle board show the strength through the static bending test. Even two of our samples were stronger than all of the other, than MDF and particle board. And that's with no added formaldehyde, no added adhesive binder. Oops, so um, this is formatting issues, but um, what are some of the implications from this? One, the potential to create a VOC-free engineered composite board that is structurally sound. Two, positive alternatives for those with chemical sensitivities. Three, utilization of a byproduct, post-industrial, post-consumer, and recycled materials. Four, added value to a byproduct made from sawdust generating operations. And five, possible engineering for improved performance, such as fastener retention. And this is actually just the surface of what we're looking at. There's actually quite a bit more um, research that we're doing. But to give you a sense of kind of the way we're looking at the material and its potential, um, some of you might be familiar with these uh, existing options out there right now. But the thing about these options are that they do have <coughs> some type of resin-based binder or a still chemical sensitive binder. And then since I have just a little bit of time left, I'll kind of quickly go through some of the um, images uh, with uh, the composite boards used. Um, so this is a sculptural desk. 
a chair. So these are, this could be completely biodegradable. This can go into the landfill. There's no hardware in it, metal hardware, and it can just biodegrade and not affect the environment. Um, you can also work with um, net forming, so you can actually create certain patterns and create less waste. Um, different consumer products, uh, packaging, substitutes. Uh, so in the image on the lower right, um, within the iPad case, um, we put our um, composite material in there. Um, sometimes the composite material can also be completely hidden. So this is just veneered white oak um, table, but the inner core is the particle borne material, or um, are naturally bonded, comparable to particle borne material. And then I just have um, some examples of student work. So to give you a sense that really, this is open, uh, the experimentation of this material can be open to anybody. It can be a student who actually has a lot of um, amazing solutions as well to contribute. Great, thank you.